Andreas, thank you for joining me on the podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. So you're a movement specialist. You coach people through exercise, through lifestyle optimization, and I've seen your content online or on social media, and you've got some really interesting videos and ways of coaching people through what looks like to be very circadian appropriate uh, exercise routines. So I'm really interested in, in talking to you uh, about this. So maybe we'll we'll start with how you got into exercising and coaching people from a lifestyle um, point of view, but with, with this circadian background. Mm-hmm. So a little bit about in general, based on my background, where I lived before, I used to live in Finland for a couple of years, for around three years. And before that, I lived in Scotland, which was quite dark and gray. So the amount of light is quite less, but I didn't have much awareness about circadian rhythms and circadian health. So I wasn't taking care of those things. When I moved to Finland, I realized that the seasonal depression kicked in and I started to realize that, okay, I need to do something about this. But it wasn't only the depression aspect and and the anxious aspect, but because they're kind of interrelated, anxiety and depression. Um, It was also like physical symptoms I started to feel. I started to feel like lack of energy, lack of drive. Uh, my workout started to suck and I wasn't recovering as well. I wasn't sleeping or feeling tired when it was time to go to bed. So I realized that there is something missing that I need to address because I thought, okay, I'm exercising right. I'm eating the right foods and I'm going to bed on time. So basically I'm trying to aim for eight hours sleep, but I wasn't blocking the blue light. I wasn't mitigating the EMFs. I wasn't, I was always training in a blue lit gym with a or lots of electromagnetic fields around me. I was uh, rarely outside because, you know, when the weather is quite cold, it's it kind of puts you off. And when your mitochondrial function is not in check because of your circadian rhythms, you also feel more cold because your body cannot simply tolerate the cold when your mitochondrial function is not in check. So that's kind of what led me to dig down that rabbit hole and started researching about quantum biology, quantum health, circadian health. And I started finding many, many interesting people like Dr. Jack Cruz, uh, yourself, Jalal Khan, Sarah Kleiner, Kari Bennett, all the, all the cool and interesting people uh, in this space. And uh, I've just learned so much and grown over time. And I've implemented those uh, aspects into my own coaching because I realized that since it improved my overall health and well-being, it allowed me to sleep deeper to wake up more refreshed, to have more energy, to have better performance in the gym and to feel like I'm alive again, as if I've gained my life back. I realized that this is something critically important that I have to implement with all of my clients as a foundation before I even tell them that exercise, you should go and exercise or you should do this diet plan. Because I realized that if I focus on the circadian rhythms, I can amplify the effects and get faster results with my clients if I add the circadian aspect first. Yeah, and it speaks to the hierarchy of things to address. And I think a a lot of people would like to exercise or they've been told that they need to exercise, but they're simply so energy depleted, um, which is reflecting um, poor mitochondrial function, that the the prospect of exercising is, is difficult. But when they address the fundamental things like um, the circadian rhythm and particularly removing processed foods, they, they they suddenly get that burst of energy that then allows kind of exercising to, to happen. Or that's how that's what I see in my my practice. The interesting thing what you said was you seem to be doing everything right. Like you were getting eight hours sleep, you were eating a healthy diet. And, and what what was your diet at the time? So I was just aiming to eat like as high protein as possible, Mm -hmm. also Mm -hmm. high fat, uh, quite minimal carbohydrates, Mm -hmm. because I always acknowledge that, you know, eating carbohydrates in excess is probably not a good idea. But I I wasn't aware of the fact that when you're living somewhere in a Nordic country, for example, that you should probably really consider if you should be consuming any carbohydrates at all, only when they're in season and the ones that are locally to you, because that's giving the electromagnetic information to our body what time of the year it is and what it should do based on based on that so that's the way that i was eating back then but still it wasn't allowing me to progress yeah and and it 
that situation is is commonplace when people think they're doing the right thing and they're exercising, they're getting into their eating appropriately for what what they believe is correct, yet still having all these problems. So it's mm-hmm. not an uncommon situation that you you were in that most that a lot of people are in, and it's because there was a big missing piece in in the mm-hmm. lifestyle lifestyle approach. Yeah. So so where you, where did you go from there, and how did you? What what were the kind of factors that you addressed critically right. to kind of improve your your health? Mm-hmm. So as soon as I started diving into it and understanding more about circadian health, I realized that blue light is a really huge issue, uh, especially at the wrong time of the day. So we need blue light at the right time of the day, but we don't want blue light at the wrong time of the day. And that's what I wasn't aware of before. And it started to make sense to me. So the first step that I took was to buy a pair of blue light blocking glasses because that was like the lowest hanging fruit. I went for the easiest option before I fixed you know, my waking and sleeping cycles, I just started by blocking the blue light at night. And just by simply doing that, as soon as the sun set, I put my red blue light blockers on. I noticed that my overall quality of sleep improved so much. I felt so much more tired when it was time to go to bed. And when I woke up in the morning, I already felt so much more refreshed. So I felt that, wow, my quality of life has improved just from buying a pair of glasses. It's insane. But then that only got me to a certain point, right? Because that I only addressed one small factor. So then I started thinking, okay, what else do I need to do uh, to, to keep going forward and to keep on improving? Because I knew how I used to feel before in Cyprus when I felt more optimal. And I, then I knew how that I actually felt suboptimal. So I had this comparison to be able to tell that, okay, this is how I should be aiming to feel. But now I feel even better than both of those states before. So now I'm probably at my most optimal state, I would say. And um, well, what led me to after was to, I, I bought a pair of yellow uh, blue light blocking glasses for the daytime when I was coaching inside the gyms because I realized that, okay, having the blue light all the way from the morning until the afternoon while I'm coaching is probably not a good idea either because I realized that I was just getting totally fried. My brain was uh, totally fried by the end of the day. And I thought, I thought, is it possible that my brain is fried only after four or five hours of coaching, even though they're spread out throughout the day, they're not even one after each other, you know? And so I was thinking this is totally not normal. And then as soon as I wore the yellow blue blockers that helped my nervous system come back to, you know, more of a parasympathetic state so it was it was really nice to observe yeah no amazing and i i started wearing my blue light blockers at work when i was doing some night shifts in in the hospital and the amount of difference i noticed from simply wearing a cheap pair of 35 dollar uvex blue blocking glasses was absolutely enormous and it's hard to it's hard to overstate the benefit and People when they when they really try it for a consistent amount of time, um, invariably think, f- find benefit. The the it's fascinating that you that you mentioned how worn out or fried you felt after you know only five hours. And yeah, I guess g- g- give people an idea. You mentioned why the blue light is um, what well, we need blue light at a certain time. Just just tell yeah. us about. What, what, what is the consequence of sitting in that gym during the day under artificial light? Okay, so to understand this, we have to understand in general the, the rhythm of the, of the sun and the, the day and night cycle, so and how our body is actually meant to operate. So our body is meant to operate on a 24-hour cycle, which is called the circadian rhythm. And so we have uh, different hormones released at different times of the day, and a lot of those hormones are, or most of the hormones are controlled by the light signals and the electromagnetic fields that are in our environment, like from the ground, for example. And when those are not in sync with what nature is doing, our body gets totally out of sync because it wants to sync with nature. But when we override that mechanism by having brighter light indoors and we isolate, for example, by not having open windows and by being underground, let's say in a gym, because most gyms are, you know, they don't have windows or they're underground, then we're basically just bombarded by that midday blue light. So the around solar noon, around midday, that's when we are having the most amount of blue in the sky. And that's meant to promote alertness and a waking state. And we also have the highest amount of UVB in the solar noon. But 
when we are indoors, we are missing all those other beneficial frequencies of light as well, where we are missing out the infrared, we're missing out the green, we're missing out the UV. So we're missing out all the other beneficial frequencies of light, which are meant to balance the, the spectrum of light, which is actually perfect and harmonizing to our body. But when it's in isolation, it's a big issue because what's, what it's doing is just raising our cortisol all the time, the entire day. And cortisol obviously is an energy costly process. In general, making hormones is an energy costly process. So if you're making cortisol the entire day and you're not allowing energy for the other hormones to take place as well, you're just basically all the time in a sympathetic state. And that's con constantly stealing electrons, uh, which is basically energy for our system. So it's stealing our energy because we are all the time in a, in a sympathetic state. And this yeah, is why and, it's so damaging to our system. Yeah, and I, I like how you brought up the hormone issue because what can happen, uh, which is known as the um, pregnenolone steel syndrome, is when we're shunting all our uh, energetic resources towards the production of cortisol, then that can have the downstream effect of compromising um, correct and appropriate uh, production of of sex hormones like progesterone estrogen uh and testosterone so it it's a, it's an it's another reason why people might find that their hormones are out of whack um as related to their um suboptimal light environment the Hello. the i guess when i think about how a lot of people work out these days it is exactly what you said is that it's in a gym which has large fluoro lights or, or led lights overhead and very, very free, infrequently do you see gyms with open windows or, or big roller doors that can let the natural light in. And yeah. I, I think it's also quite common that people are working out in like, I don't know if it's the same in Cyprus, but in Australia, there's chains of gyms. So, you know, like a franchise and they're all mm -hmm. set out in a similar way and they all have mm. the, the artificial lighting um, and they yeah. usually have a TV blaring um, a range of, or whatever the the latest uh, propaganda is playing on the TV, uh, trying to get people to buy stuff. But it's it's really, in my mind, some, something that is unappreciatedly harmful. Um, and people are trying to do the right thing by working out, but in fact, yeah. it could be having um a, the complete or a damaging effect. And the way yeah. I the way I think about the the light point that you brought up, which is that we're not getting the other forms of of light, which is non-visible light like near infrared it's almost like eating a um a really highly processed food diet so imagine yeah, if you yeah. only only ate um highly refined like uh hot hot dogs that have had been incredibly processed that's the same thing because we're we're, we're having a nutrient deficient light diet we're not getting the infrared and we're only getting our isolated kind of blue and so so what what's your approach then for your clients if you're if you if we're recognizing the harm of blue light um we mm -hmm. obviously want people to exercise what's your approach mm -hmm. what's your next step for for someone who wants to do circadian appropriate exercising mm -hmm. so what we want to do is we want to first we want to go for the lowest hanging fruit and based on the person's situation so we i always work individually you know based on people's circumstances if if they only have access to a gym and they can only go and exercise or is there time that they are devoting for themselves when they're going to go in a gym? We're just still going to find a way to mitigate those harms. Just as I explained to you earlier about wearing the blue light blockers, for example, when they're training, I would personally advise them that they should buy a pair of yellow blue light blocking gloss glasses, which is not going to block all the blue, but it's still going to keep them alert and it's going to, you know, at least minimize the amount of light going in through the eyes. I acknowledge that the skin also has photoreceptors as well. So it's advisable that people wear long clothing as well. But I understand that many people don't want to wear. It just depends how serious you want to take, you know, the light, the light topic into consideration. But uh, in my opinion, is extremely serious because it, contr it contr controls everything else, all the hormones, the recovery, the performance and everything like this. And when we are in an indoor environment, basically, we are just constantly frying the system. And the issue is that the majority of people anyway are spending at least 90% of their time indoors. So by taking your exercise and movement outside, it's an opportunity to be outside, right? It's another excuse to be 
outside, potentially grounded, depending on your area, if you've got grass or beach or whatever, or your, or your own garden. And you can do it under the full spectrum light, even on a cloudy day, because the, the light is still there. Even if it's cold outside, you can still exercise. You just have to wear more clothes, you know? So, of course, sometimes when it's snowing, you have to you know, do like what I'm doing in my house. You know, I'm, I'm just m mitigating my, in my indoor light environment. I have my windows open and I have my home gym set up in a circadian appropriate lighting, which is not going to cause me harm when I'm exercising. Because when we have blue light and non-native EMFs while we are exercising, why is it a big issue? The reason is that we are losing electrons while we are, you know, when we are trying to do something physically taxing at the same time, which is also requiring energy. So our performance is constantly going down because we're not only using energy for the training, but we're also using energy just to survive, just to be in that environment. And so by simply switching the environment that we're in by going outdoors, instead of losing electrons, which is a form of energy, we are actually gaining electrons. So it's pretty insane that actually we are not only you know we're doing more good like all the time and the fact that we're moving anyway we're generating electrons through piezoelectricity through the movement of our body as well so we want to make sure that we are outside as much as we can with our movement and how i work normally with my clients is so that i advise them to build a home gym because that's one of the greatest investments that they could do. If, let's say it costs you $1,000 to build a home gym and a gym membership is $500 per year. In two years, it will have been paid off your home gym. I know it's a, maybe a big upfront investment for some individuals, but once you do it, then you have it in your home where you can, you can control your lighting, you can control your electromagnetic field environment if you cannot train outside. Because, for example, you might will not want to keep your gym equipment outdoors if it's going to get rusty, or if you know it's not if it's snowing, for example, then it's probably dangerous to use weights outside. Then you probably need to use it inside. But at least you're controlling your own environment, your own little bulb, bubble. So you're creating your own world where you can create healthy circadian-friendly training. Yeah, very very good advice. People these days are wearing Apple Watches, they're wearing Fitbits, they're wearing AirPods. Talk to us about why this might be harmful, especially in the context of exercising. Okay, so I will start by saying that in general, why I don't personally wear, let's say, a, you know, a, a fitness tracker is for the reason being is that, first of all, it makes you out of tune or out of sync with your body. You, you want to be more in sync with your body and to acknowledge when is your heart rate elevating? When is your heart rate, you know, decreasing? Like, how do you feel? And more listen to your body rather trying to strive for numbers. Of course, I understand it's a good, it's a good uh, way to measure your progress or your performance in a non-biased way if you don't look at it in the training. The whole idea is that you wear it and you forget about it, not that you keep on staring at it all the time. So if you want to have good trainings in general, you need your focus to be there in the training. You don't want to be focusing on other things like your phone or your, your gadgets. And so not only that, but then we also have a lot of electromagnetic fields which are produced by those devices to connect to our cell phone. And especially when those are not put on airplane mode, uh, especially the earphones, which you cannot put on airplane mode because that's how they connect wirelessly. It's through microwave radiation, and microwave radiation is extremely harmful, especially over long periods of time. It's not so much that it all depends on the duration and the intensity. So that's how it works with the non-native electromagnetic fields. The more time we're exposed to the non-native electromagnetic fields, the more harm they can cause us because it's all about how close we are to it and the duration. So it's it has a compounding effect. And what are we doing also the rest of the day? So for example, if I wear for one hour AirPods, but then the rest of the day, I don't use my phone at all. I'm outside grounded. Then that's way better than using your AirPods and the whole day using your phone and then using your laptop and then going home and watching TV and never grounding and never being outdoors. So what's happening there is that you're just constantly bombarding your system, frying your system and stealing energy from your body and you're making your body in a sympathetic state so we are constricting the body so this is why it's not ideal to wear you know wireless earphones or to wear fitness trackers because those are actually taking away from us instead of giving to us so 
of course, it's better to use wired uh, earphones if you want to wear earphones. Yeah, and and Dr. Jack Cruz explains to people uh, the harm of non-native EMF in terms of what, what a bit of an uh, an argument uh, at extremum or kind of em- embellished example. But what happens when you put a, a steak in a microwave? <laughs> it, yeah. it becomes it, it becomes pretty quickly leathery and 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 tough. So you can imagine that when you're in a blue lit gym and they've probably got Wi-Fi going on not far from where, wherever you're working out. Um, and then you've also got the headphones and the Fitbit and the Apple Watch on. You're like, you're microwaving yourself and then you're in a, big, a bigger microwave. It's like double yeah. microwaving. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and, and then you can imagine like when someone goes, they say they do it at 6 a.m. in the morning and they're getting that blue light signal very, very early when the body's expecting red, it's expecting infrared um, mm-hmm. is expecting maybe a bit of UVA a, a bit earlier in the morning, but it's only getting blue. And then that yeah. person go, goes to work in a cubicle um, and continues mm. the the artificial light exposure and Wi-Fi exposure and then kind of wonders why their hair is going gray at the age of um, of 30. So mm. it's like it's like a, a hidden a hidden damage that, that people really aren't, aren't appreciating. So I, I love mm-hmm. it how you how you really help to uh frame these these harms and then kind of get people back into a natural environment because uh, i mean i had this conversation with scott zimmerman on an earlier podcast it's like we can use all these fancy terms and give people the kind of minutiae of the quantum level effect of um of the harm they're doing but essentially the yeah. job that, that you're helping people with andreas and i am is simply just getting back into the environment where, where we evolved yeah. in so yes. so so what, what Exactly. So what, what, what else do you like to do from a movement point of view? What's your approach that you like to help people with? Mm-hmm. So I also like to give people um, tools so they can use their own body as a form of a gym. So they can train anywhere, outdoors or indoors, but ideally outdoors. That's, that's the whole idea where I've built these mobility workouts where people can use their body to improve their mobility and get a really good workout out of it at the same time. And so that they can take their body anywhere, no matter where they are, no matter if they're on vacation or if they're in their office or if they are outside of their office, you know, on the grass during their lunch break, whatever they want to do, wherever they can fit it into their lifestyle so they can get some movement in. And that's what I help people with. And that's the whole idea that we move the body in a holistic manner because doing weight training is not ideal either because weight training, what we are doing, if we are training in a very linear, linear way, in an up and down way, we want to be focusing a lot on rotation. We want to be moving the body in more dynamic ways and lengthening the tissues while strengthening the tissues. And that's what helps us improve our mobility as well. I'm not saying that uh, weight training doesn't improve the mobility, but you just have to know how to do it right. If you are not doing a uh, full range of motion in the exercises, if you're not like you know, really feeling the stretch on specific exercises, you're probably not gaining the mobility that you're aiming for. This is why I designed these mobility workouts because they are less threatening to the brain because when we are under load, our system is more afraid. So it's more easy to, you know, try and take the body to extremes with the body weight rather than, you know, using weights. Yeah, and and uh, I think about... Uh, a range of kind of approaches when I advise people to to exercise, but uh, body weight is is a key aspect of that because if you think about something like a push up or a pull up, it is it's a very it's a compound exercise. It's mm-hmm. very intuitive and it's very kind of it's simple. So other yeah. than those real basics, what 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 are there some examples of exercise that you you recommend? You mean in terms of name names of exercises? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a bit hard to give names because without showing or explaining, you know, in in extreme detail. But um, some things that I do like to focus on are a little bit like um, Edo portal style movement or animal flow style movement or Mm. freestyle. So it looks a bit like breakdancing, but with more control, more intention. So what you're doing is that you're trying to go inside of your body and you're trying to become aware of every single part of your body as you're moving. This is also how we help ourselves eliminate and prevent injuries is because we're starting to listen to our body and become more in tune. And so by connecting our hands and our feet on the ground, 
we are also improving our proprioception, which means is the information from our environment. Okay, so that's giving us more information of what is gravity like on Earth, you know? <laughs> this is how I'm supposed to respond. So it makes me more badass against gravity, basically. Yeah, and, and the other advantage that we, we, could, we can touch on now in terms of working out outside is, is grounding. And mm -hmm. that is something that you're not going to be able to get if we're wearing gym shoes in a gym. So how do you think about grounding and in terms of uh, working out and, and maybe how it might be aiding in, in recovery as well? Mm -hmm. So as we mentioned previously, that when we are outside, we are gaining more electrons than we are losing. So the outdoor environment is naturally an electron-rich environment. Nature never makes mistakes. So when we are outdoors, we are actually meant to thrive. When we come indoors, it's a suboptimal environment unless we try and mitigate as much as we can. So we, at least we are at a neutral state, but we can never be in a, in a positive state, just like when we are outdoors. So when we are indoors, we just need to try and prevent the harms. And when we are outdoors, we are just naturally getting all the benefits without even trying. And that's the beautiful thing of nature. Only if we live by nature's laws. So, so if we are wearing shoes, that's not going to do us any good, right? Because we are not going to be grounded because we are wearing rubber soles. But if we are wearing something like earth runners or, you know, leather, leather shoes, or we are walking on the beach barefoot or on grass and so on, we are getting all those beneficial, beneficial free electrons from the, from the ground. And because the electromagnetic fields from the earth, they are, super important for regulating our circadian rhythm as well because the body doesn't like just pay attention to the light because what is light light is part of the electromagnetic spectrum it's just the part that we can see or we can't see as well so then also the schumann resonance is part of the electromagnetic spectrum and the circadian rhythm is also paying attention to that and when we are indoors close to wi-fi routers or you know cell phones other people's cell phones around us it's confusing our body. It's thinking that, okay, what's going on? So it puts us in a state of fight and flight. When we are outdoors, automatically our nervous system is down-regulated. So that means that we can actually be more calm and that's actually more beneficial when we are moving and exercising. You would think it's the opposite, that you want to be more on the edge, more excited when you're training, but actually you want to be more calm and more relaxed because your brain can think more clearly. You can be more focused because if you think about yourself in a state when you are really frightened, you feel that everything around you blurs out and you have this tunnel vision and you can't focus. You can only care about one thing, which is surviving. But if you're in a parasympathetic state, you're more receptive to your environment. You can absorb more information. Your muscles are more relaxed, which is very important for injury prevention because when we are indoors and we are in a sympathetic state, in a fight and flight state, our body is in more of a contraction state and when we are in a in a muscle contraction state that means all, not only our muscles but also our organs right and all the parts of our body and our brain are not receiving the oxygen they're not receiving the blood flow that they deserve and the nutrients that they need and also to remove the metabolic waste which is super super important through the lymphatic system and so when we are outside we are actually allowing all of that to take place and so it's just like magic yeah, by being outdoors because automatically we are being more optimal with our body and we are literally improving our performance just by simply taking our workouts outside. And not only that, we're also getting, you know, more nitric oxide because of the sun that's helping to improve blood flow and we are more relaxed. So then the, so if you think about a muscle, which is not relaxed, it's like a sponge. So the the water cannot go in the sponge, but then when the muscle relaxes, all the water can flow into the sponge. So that's basically how the body works. When you are more relaxed, all the blood can flow everywhere. But when you're more tense, you know, from the EMFs or the blue light from the cortisol elevation, then you're going to be more tense. And that has a big impact on your fascia or inside your body. Yeah. And Dr. Sean O'Mara, who uses uh, a sprinting quite frequently, uh, advises mm -hmm. sprinting as part of his protocol, and and I do too in, in terms of helping people eliminate visceral fat and in terms of mm -hmm. really high intensity oh, exercise. Yeah. He he makes the point that Homo sapiens humans are the only animal that needs to warm up 
before before reaching <laughs> top, top, top speed. Like you see a gazelle on the African savanna, and it doesn't. Uh-huh. It goes from standing still to full uh-huh. sprint when it when it's running away from a lion in like in a yes. split second. And yes. hu- humans are the only animal that is like, oh, hang on, I, I better do a couple warm up sets so I don't pull my hamstring. So I, I wonder how much degree that what you just talked about, which is the constant grounding, is aiding uh-huh. in in helping animals like that be so responsive to the need to, to sprint. Mm-hmm. It's also the grounding, but also the fact that, yes, the grounding is also helping us improve the blood flow around the body. But the fact that they are constantly in a ready state is what makes all the difference. So human is the only one who has invented the chair. <laughs> and now we are, I, know, I, I acknowledge that we are sitting on a chair right now to do this interview, but the most ideal position would be to be in a resting squat for humans. That is the ideal resting position. Or if you are ever sitting outside in nature, don't you notice that you can't sit down comfortably somewhere? There is literally nowhere comfortable to sit down. <laughs> you have to keep on moving, right? The, so what this does, this micro movement, this constant micro movement allows your body to remain in a ready state. So you are still in a social engagement state, in a parasympathetic state, but your body is able to switch very quickly into a sympathetic state if it needs to, to run away from a threat. Or if you were to catch a prey, for example. But if we are sitting for a prolonged period of time, we start to create stagnation in the body and the stagnation is starting to lead to stiffness. And then if you combine that with blue light, and non-native EMFs, you have major, major stiffness. I mean, I've observed this in everyone who has any desk job, even in myself, when I have to do my social media work, let's say even if it's one hour and I'm sitting down, I just feel so stiff afterwards. And the first thing that I do, I do a full on mobility routine that takes me like one minute, but I covers the entire body and I just feel golden afterwards. But it just shows you that just by simply sitting and then adding the electromagnetic field and the blue light, you get even more stiff. But one thing I can tell you, though, is when I'm reading a book, I do not get half as stiff versus when I'm using a computer or a phone. Very interesting. And I want to make a comment now about the blue zones and this idea that there's certain areas in the world where there's extreme longevity. And Mm -hmm. in, in in, in the dietary circles, there's endless debate about what people are eating and to what degree is that contributing to their longevity. And I think a high degree of animal products is, is key. But if we think about what else these old people are doing in terms of what you're talking about, Andreas, is that they're outside all the time and, and they're moving all the time. And I think of the, a lot of long lived people that I know who are in in their hundreds and or night, late nineties and still thriving. They are always moving. They're always moving in, in constant motion uh, outside, they're doing this, they're doing that. No one is sitting down all, all the time. Yeah. And and on the contrary, the the the, mo- the most sick p- patients that I that you see that are almost kind of on the way to to heaven's door in a nursing home with lots of visceral fat are just you know they're they're, they're petrified in stone almost. They're just just mm-hmm. completely not moving. So immobile. Yeah. Immobile, exactly. And uh, I really think that what you're talking about is uh, is a, a relevant and key part of that. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the term use it or lose it is a very real thing because the, the less you do something, like let's say, for example, raising your arms over your head, you will very soon lose that ability if you do not do it every single day. And this is why when you notice some elderly people, for example, when they are when they're past their 60s or 70s, they, they cannot raise their arm you know, all the way vertically, that is because they haven't been practicing those movements and so those movement patterns. So this is why it's so critical to exercise and move the body when you can. And it's never too late to start. Even that person can actually gain that range of motion back. It's just that it's way easier to do it when it's earlier in life and maintain it rather than have to do it when you've already lost it and gain it back because I have worked with individuals who have been 60 or 70 years old and we have improved their quality of life massively being able to allow them to do a full range squat all the way down us to the grass with no knee pain no hip pain be able to raise their arms over their head and to be able to get up and down from the floor all of these very important human functions and so if we do not practice these things every day we are definitely going to lose them yeah and and talk to us about sprinting and 
like full exertion exercise. What's your take? When do you use it? And how? what other kinds of um, high intensity exercise do you like to use? Okay, so sprinting is a fantastic exercise because it allows the entire body to be utilized during the actual movement itself. It's probably one of the most complete human movements. We are actually designed to walk, run, and sprint, which is basically to locomote, right? We start off on our hands and feet. We start by crawling. This is why I also teach a lot about crawling in my movement sessions is because it's a very primitive pattern and we are giving more information to the brain. It makes our nervous system feel safe when we are crawling on all fours because we are getting more information from our environment. But once we've gotten really good at that, that actually allows us to become better walkers, better runners and better sprinters. Because before you can run, you must walk. Before you can sprint, you must run. So it, because the body only gives grants you access to what it feels the most safe to. This always comes back to the brain and the safety thing. So if we want to be able to run faster, we need to be able, I mean, to sprint. We need to be able to just run slower and show the body that we can slow down. Because this is actually teaching the body that, okay, he's in control, so I can give him more. I can give him more range of motion in his legs. I can give him more power, more explosiveness. And so sprinting is a fantastic exercise also on the metabolic side of things as well, because we are using a lot of glucose from the system. And that's allowing us to deplete our glucose. And that's actually putting less stress on our insulin as well. And so then we're able to go in more of a, into more of a fat burning state if our diet is primarily low carb and with high in fat and high in protein. But if we are eating very high carbohydrate, very high fat and very and low protein, we are not really going to go into that fat utilization state. We're just going to use whatever is there and there might be even some excess. <laughs> so we actually want to be doing it right if we're doing it for fat loss reasons. But if we're doing it, for example, for athleticism, then that's completely different because let's say you are metabolically healthy, you don't have a lot of visceral fat and, and fat on your, on your belly area to lose and you want to optimize your performance, then you want to eat carbohydrates seasonally and to do it strategically around your training. Yeah, that, that's a, maybe we'll, we'll talk about that very soon in terms of dietary strategies. But yeah, I, I think sprinting is, is fantastic as well. And uh, like Andreas said, if you haven't sprinted before, you it, it definitely is a great idea to build up. And I, I, I like the way that you framed that that crawling kind of progression, that stepwise progression into into full sprinting. Uh, and yeah, I, I never thought about it that way, but it does make sense that when when you're crawling or using all four hands or on the ground, that to me is a pretty ancestrally appropriate uh kind of movement pattern and and if you think about mammalian evolution um i mean we only evolved bipedalism um or, i mean it's, it's a fair while back but um if you look at our closest pri uh, primate ancestors they they're very often crawling gorillas chimpanzees they're using their hands um to move in a lot lot more than we are as as uh, humans so yeah that that makes a lot of sense to me and maybe maybe we could talk a bit about your specific approaches to men versus women. Do you make any mm -hmm. distinction about uh, exercise advice to, to men compared to women? Yes, of course. Uh, we have to always consider that men work on a 24 hour cycle within terms of the hormones and then women work on a 28 day cycle. And we need to take that into consideration when it comes to the training, because we don't want to be pushing, you know, when we're leading up to the period and also afterwards as well because we want to allow the body to restore and to recover because it's going through a very energy costly process uh, when we are losing blood and so on and we have to make sure that we are taking it a little bit more easy and this is why my mobility workouts are a perfect way because we can tune them in a way that we don't need to be taxing the nervous system so much because with the body weight you don't but also you can do that with weights too of course you don't have to just go all out on the weights you just have to be a bit more wise but with weights it's more easy to go overboard and to really push yourself whereas with body weight you can you know pace yourself more and be a bit more in tune with your body so with guys it's um we have like an appropriate time of the day to train the same for ladies as well but for the ladies we have to consider which part of their cycle they're in to know when we can actually push and when it's time to back off 
Yeah, great. I, lo- I love that distinction and that nuance and recognizing that there is a, a cyclical nature to to um, femininity and respecting that with regard to exercise, diet, cold exposure, and what might be appropriate at one, one part of the cycle um, is might definitely not be appropriate at another part of the cycle. So mm-hmm. uh, I really like that. And for, for women, do you have any specific uh, recommendations? I mean, I, I like yoga. I think that mm-hmm. yoga is great for both men, men and women, but particularly mm-hmm. perhaps leading up to the period, something like a mobility, mobility and, and yoga is, is something that I really like to recommend. Yes, that's for sure. One of the best ways, just in general, moving, walking, uh, swimming, um, even like a light jog is fine as long as you're not straining. Anything that you're not straining yourself and you actually feel that you're not putting yourself in this fight and flight state is the most ideal thing to do. So even like a light cycling session, anything that would be endurance, for example, as long as it's not overly taxing can be good. But holistic movement, moving on all fours and being, you know, in tune with your body, foam rolling, you know, doing saunas, uh, massage guns, all the stuff that's basically self-care things. Those are the most ideal things for ladies to incorporate before and after their their period so that they can restore themselves and to also prepare themselves. Yeah, great advice. Let's talk a bit a bit about cold exposure because... Mm-hmm. Uh, you think about how professional athletes use cold and, you know, after a game of a big game of professional rugby, you'll find the athletes in, in an ice bath um, after mm-hmm. they've, they've had a, a massive game. What, what's mm-hmm. your take on cold exposure and how do you think that people can most benefit from using it? So cold exposure has to be done wisely and we have to consider the exactly, as you said, the time of the day that we're doing it, but it also depends what your aim is out of doing it. So some people might be doing it more from the just trying to improve their metabolic function, to try and improve their leptin sensitivity and to try and become you know, healthier. And some individuals are doing it just to try and improve their recovery, to improve their performance and so on. And if you're trying to do it to improve your performance and to allow you to be able to be ready for the next day, for example, let's say you are playing football, American football, and you have two games back to back, you know, Saturday and Sunday, then of course doing it, you know, as much as you can during those two days, it's, it's okay to do because you're actually allowing your body to be in, you know, ready faster and you don't get as sore. But if you're trying to build muscle, it's more ideal to, you know, postpone it a couple of hours later or even on your rest days to do ice baths. You know, so because it does decrease like blood flow, it does decrease inflammation and inflammation is requi- required for the recovery process because we do need inflammation, but just in the in the right time. So when we are exercising, we are breaking down things. And this is why um, why I like the mobility workouts is because the, if you take them more easy, you don't break down so much muscle. But the more you push yourself, the more muscle you can break down. And so when you break down more muscle, obviously, that's going to lead to rebuilding. And that takes a lot of energy from the body. But then you also need the inflammatory process to take place to be able to aid that recovery. Yes, great, great advice. And these are cold is a stressor, just like deliberate yes. sun exposure, just like exercise itself. These are all what are known as hormetic stresses, which is a temporary um, intermittent um, amount of stress that we put our bodies under that then allow us to compensate and, and grow stronger and become become healthier. So, yeah, I, I really think that your approach of, of being specific about our intent of why we're using the cold and how we're using it um, is is great, great advice. Let's, let's talk about diet quickly because you mentioned earlier in the podcast that what might be appropriate at a, the, at the Finnish northern latitude um, in terms of our dietary carbohydrate intake is not going to be the, the same for someone at a uh, equatorial latitude. And I think it's not going to be the same for someone who has metabol- metabolic disease or leptin or insulin resistance. So yes. you t- t- talk to us about you, the, the dietary advice that you give to a lot of your clients, maybe based on, on those nuances. So someone, let's say, who is living at a higher latitude um, will naturally in their environment will not have so many vegetables and fruits growing. So that indicates to us immediately that, 
okay, maybe I should consider not eating those things because even though they are available in the supermarket or even in the freezer section, which has been shipped from, you know, Brazil, Costa Rica, you know, and so on, then that doesn't mean that you, you should be eating that food because it's creating a circadian mismatch at the time of the year because we don't have only like a 24-hour circadian rhythm. We have also like a yearly circadian rhythm, a seasonal circadian rhythm. So our body can tell what time of the year it is and how, how it should change its processes internally. And so basically when, when you are living at a higher latitude, you cannot tolerate so many carbohydrate-rich foods and you should be aiming for more fat and high-protein foods, which are basically animal foods. Those are the best sources and the most bioavailable. Whereas if you are living closer to the equator, you have an abundant amount of fruits and vegetables. But if you are metabolically unhealthy and you need to fix your leptin and your insulin and you have high bl blood glucose, then for sure you should probably not uh, consume you know, high carbohydrates, even if you're living on the equator, because even I, this is one thing that I noticed with a lot of individuals, for example, here in Cyprus, is that even though they live in Cyprus, it's as if they are living in a Nordic country. Do you know why? Why? Because they're living well, okay, indoors. So yeah, they're living indoors. They're wearing sunglasses. Um, they're they're covering up from the sun. Um, they're essentially stimulate simulating a low UV environment. Exactly, exactly. And then basically, what that means is that their body is like completely confused, you know, and completely mismatched. And that's basically allowing allowing our body to create more inflammation inside the body because it's completely confused. We are consuming a lot of carbohydrates, even though our body thinks we're you know living at a higher latitude and you know everything is out of sync so everything is not working as it should so we we also uh, when we're living closer to the equator we also have a higher uv environment as you mentioned and this is actually allowing us to detoxify more and to sweat more and this is actually allowing us to get rid of a heavy metal called deuterium which is clogging our mitochondria deuterium is not necessarily a bad thing it's just a bad thing in excess and especially in individuals who are metabolically unhealthy and the the more deuterium we deplete the more we can intake but the more we have accumulated inside our system through eating fruits and vegetables because it's primarily found in coconuts cacao fruits vegetables those are like the highest sources and probably some supplements as well which we need to be aware of yeah and i think that framing it for the listener is the amount of carbohydrate for some of this that's insulin and leptin sensitive, metabolically healthy, which is not a lot of people, mm -hmm. but um, for those who are, the amount of carbohydrates you can tolerate is going to be commensurate with the ultraviolet light environment that you're existing in. And as yep. Andreas has mentioned, is the, the reason why that is the case is because ultraviolet light is what permits fruits and vegetables to grow. And yep. it, it, it's if we take, if we, I guess, maybe summarize what we're talking about in this past um, hour is that we're all about creating coherence. It's cre creating coherence between your body and your environment, whether that is being out in the sunlight to to sync the body up with the circadian signal for that particular time of day, whether it's grounding to give your body um, a geographical point of orientation and coherence for the exact latitude that you're you're at, um, or it's it's giving a coherent signal through the consumption of food that is growing at that that location it's uh it's almost it's so simple it's complicated i think um for 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 a lot of people and uh, i heard dr jack cruz mentioned once uh, in a recent podcast is hum humanity is unable to survive above the 60th latitude and that's and one of the reasons is because uh, or can't thrive above that latitude is because there's yeah. not a lot of photosynthesis going on but what what happens is when people are inside or they're wearing um, clothing, they're wearing sunglasses, uh, they're not getting out. They're essentially s simulating a low UV environment. So, yeah. so as you say, if you're eating a carb or seed oil rich diet while simulating a low UV environment, that is mm -hmm. a massive recipe for developing insulin, leptin uh, resistance and, and packing on the visceral fat. Yeah, it's going to cause chronic inflammation and chronic inflammation, low grade, especially when it goes unnoticed is like, you know, one of the root, root causes of all Neolithic diseases, you know, it's when we have this micro inflammation in the body, then 
you know, we get like things like plaque buildup and, and so on in the, in our cardiovascular systems uh, because our body is trying to protect us from the inflammation. So this is something that we need to be aware of and we need to try and be in sync uh, with the environment as much as we can because by simply just going outside and waking up with the sunrise, going to bed with the sunset, um, or if we're not going to bed with the sunset, at least wearing red, blue light blockers at night and using red light bulbs in the home to to make the body think that it's still sunset until we decide to go to bed, then, you know, that's the way, you know, to, for the body to be healthy because we are aligning ourselves with nature. When we just observe nature and we observe all the animals, they're constantly grounded, right? They are always outside. And if they are not in the sun, they're in the shade because they're smart. You know, we are the only ones who put on sunscreens, put on sunglasses and think that we can spend 10 hours in the sun just because we've applied those things on our body you know we're just defying the laws of nature even animals are so clever that when they get enough sun they go in the shade but they're still receiving the full spectrum light because they're just simply in the shade they're not indoors yeah it's they're great points and it's a process of understanding all these pieces but again it just comes back to what is what's ancestral what's natural what's how do we live in accordance with with Mother Nature's rules? And um, yeah. I think that the to to give a, a an asset or a facet about diet, and we, we can talk quickly about carnivore because I'm sure that um, a lot of people or some of your clients are using a, a carnivore type diet. So when when have you found found benefit for for people using carnivore? I guess we've we've already touched on it a little bit, but maybe mm-hmm. if you could just spell it out again for the listener. Mm -hmm. So anybody who is metabolically unhealthy, anybody who is not insulin uh, sensitive and is not, uh, is leptin resistant, we definitely have to incorporate a more of a zero to low carb diet because that's allowing our body to utilize everything that is available there. It's allowing to sync the body in accordance uh, with nature. So basically when we eat a high fat diet, what we are doing, we're actually improving our mitochondrial function and the mitochondria are the ones that are creating the energy inside the system. And when we are able to generate more energy, we're able to heal ourselves because if we don't have energy, we can't repair, we can't have performance, we can't have health, we can't have vitality because what is vitality? Vitality is literally to have an excess of energy than what you actually need, because that means that you have creativity enthusiasm you know you're outgoing you're all of those things that what nature does to you it it allows you to optimize your mitochondrial function without even trying so anybody who has those metabolic conditions for sure needs to consider uh using um, a carnivore style diet and because those nutrients are the most bioavailable as well and the least taxing on the gut as well because the more uh foods we are putting in our system the more taxed our gut becomes and that's how we get all the bloating and the leaky gut issues especially if people have dysregulated circadian rhythms they are more likely to have leaky gut too and if you are eating foods which have phytonutrients which are defense chemicals in uh, in plants and and different things like this that are going to irritate the gut, then what's going to happen is when you eat those, those are going to enter the bloodstream uh, because of the leaky gut, and it's going to cause inflammation. And if you're doing that over a prolonged period of time and you start to gain weight, even though you're supposedly eating right, let's say you're already eating vegetables and and high protein and high fat, but you're still gaining fat, then it might be something to consider that you you need to actually heal the gut by fixing first the circadian rhythm and then secondly the diet. Amazing, Andres. I'm so glad you brought that up because this is the the mind blowing implication, which kind of colors in and adds so much nuance to the diet diet wars. Which is, if we are unable or if we're gaining weight, if we're feeling sick despite um um again what we think is a healthy diet, it is the reality is that there's a circadian regulation of enterocyte of of gut lining. Um, and mm-hmm. turnover and the contributing factor or a key contributing factor to leaky gut or is a, a disrupted circadian rhythm so mm-hmm. people would might otherwise be able to tolerate a small amount of plant foods and still thrive if their circadian rhythm were were intact which i think is is a point that you're, you've made and, and i make that I, not many people are, are, are coming to so the the other implication i think that is worth spelling out is that 
once we are healed from a gut point of view, from a, a leptin insulin resistance point of view, from a visceral fat point of view, to me, it it doesn't. We don't need to restrict ourselves from locally grown seasonal carbohydrates if we're if we're healthy and it's appropriate to that season. And and yeah. it's my opinion. I don't know what what you. I'll get your opinion on this. But it was my opinion that I think the one reason why Dr. Paul Saldino um, stopped recommending a uh, strict carnivore diet was because um, it stopped working for him because he was trying to maintain that uh, strict zero carb approach at a very equatorial latitude. Um, and mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, for sure. I mean, if you are living on the equator and you are training a lot as well and you're doing a carnivore diet, you're for sure going to deplete your body very quickly of all its, uh, you know, electrolytes and all its sources, you know, of energy. And you are going to need more electrolytes to stay hydrated for sure and of course when we eat carbohydrate rich foods that holds on to more water inside the body so that allows more cellular hydration even though that's not the most ideal water because our body makes its own water the mitochondria make the most pristine water that exists uh, but that's primarily through a you know ketogenic style diet but when we eat carbohydrate rich foods then we are not able to make as much of that water as well so I guess that eating eating fruits um, in the right context is very important. So, and if you if it's perfect for your body, so if you're metabolically healthy, if you don't carry excess fat, if you're leptin sensitive, if your circadian rhythms are in check, and if you feel that you are lacking the energy in your training and with your performance, and you are your sleep is disrupted because your cortisol is too high then it's probably beneficial for you to co incorporate some carbohydrates. But again, it's, it should be in, uh, not in excess. It should be ke kept to a minimum because we should only supply the body with carbohydrates when it actually needs it, not because we think it needs it. So this is, again, coming back to trying to listen to our body that how am I feeling today? Do I have improved energy levels after eating a papaya, for example? But eating a papaya every day might not be the ideal thing. So this is something that you need to experiment with. So, for example, you might try one week eating a papaya every day, but that's the only carb that you eat and you eat just a carnivore the rest of the diet. And then the next week you experiment by eating it every other day and observe how you feel and maybe minimizing the portion size to half a papaya and then eating every day and finding that that amount which is perfect for your body because everybody's so bio individual and everyone's metabolisms are different you know we all have we all carry different amounts of muscle mass and the closer you are to the equator the more carbohydrates you can handle and so this is all things that we need to consider when thinking about the amount of carbohydrates that we should be eating and the carbs that we should be eating are the things that really only existed more than 100 years ago because if we are eating something like pasta or wheat or you know pizza all this all this processed stuff you know this which didn't exist this is going to cause havoc and chaos on our system and that's honestly never good at no matter what time of the year because it just didn't exist in nature yes exactly and the i think the message is is really nuanced and it's but we're, but you're really laying it out quite clearly andreas which is you might be able to include some whole food carbohydrates if it's seasonally appropriate um, mm -hmm. and if you're you're metabolically healthy. And that might look like um, half a papaya, papaya twice a week. And maybe mm -hmm. if you've got no, or you've got much less UV light or healthy sunlight in the week leading up to it, you don't eat, 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 eat the papaya. Um, or if you do eat it, it's you're, you're making sure you're outside, you know, in, close to solar noon so the, yeah. these are all the the nuances that we like to make um that i think get people closer to what is going to be ideal ideal for them so um, amazing stuff i i really have enjoyed this conversation andreas do you have any kind of closing thoughts or anything that we haven't covered that you'd like to talk to tell the audience the only thing that we didn't cover was about the injury side of things the risk of injury when training indoors versus training outside so it's not so much about being indoors but it's more about what is the environment created indoors right so when we are indoors we are more likely to create an incoherent environment which is not circadian appropriate and it's we are surrounded by other people's electromagnetic fields even if we are not carrying a cell phone on us even if we are not wearing smart watches or earphones we're surrounded by other people's 
phones and earbuds and we have the fluorescent lights overhead and so on and what this does is that it, it dehydrates the body just as you mentioned previously like a microwave and when we dehydrate the body we put our body at greater risk for injury because our body is primarily made out of water and especially when we when we look at the fascia like how it's you know mainly made out of water which is this collagenous tendinous style structure in the body like a spider web if that's dehydrated that is that is a more greater risk at uh, rupturing for the reason being that it's less pliable because anything that is you know more dry is not going to flex or be able to stretch as far but something that is more hydrated is going to less likely you know uh, have a damage and so by being outdoors we're actually stimulating cellular hydration through the light and through the grounding through the electromagnetic fields of the ground and all the positive electrons i mean the negative electrons that we're getting from the ground as well so this is why it's so important to try and consider taking our exercise outdoors if we can because it's another reason to be outside because too much of us are spending time indoors more than we actually want to because you know we are going from home driving in the car getting out of the car going into the office out of the office to the store all of these places are indoors and and the system has been designed in a way where we are literally stuck indoors so that was my my closing thought that we should try and consider to be outside as much as we can yeah yeah and if you think about the muscle beach athletes you know back in was it the 1970s on on venice beach in california these guys yeah. were, were were working out outdoors and their physiques i mean in classical bodybuilding their, their physiques are still looked upon as some of the, the the best the i mean the other aspect to this and maybe we'll, we'll really just quickly touch on this is i remember hearing hearing a case on on twitter of a gentleman who was uh, a strict carnivore. I'm not sure for how long there, there wasn't a, a lot of uh, kind of information around around the the case, but he was a strict carnivore and he had a, a acute myocardial infarction. He had a an LAD stenosis, so 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 called widowmaker, despite being on on a very low insulin kind of insulin provoking diet, which is which is yeah. carnivore. But the mm-hmm. the reason why he found out about this attack is because he went into atrial fibrillation, which is a irregular heart rhythm, and it was mm-hmm. detected on his Apple Watch. Um, mm-hmm. And in his photo, he was in in a gym. He was in, uh, I believe he was indoors in, in a gym. So to yeah. me, uh, I'm thinking, okay, so what is the context of which someone might um, have such a severe problem, like um, develop a, 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 have an AMI in an, and a coronary artery occlusion um, despite having a, a low insulin um, uh, environment, which is yeah. if we think about endothelial endothelial dysfunction as kind of the mm. underlying reason why we're developing um, blood blood clots in in our arterial system, then yeah. it kind of this the circadian pers- and quantum perspective that you've just given us over the last hour really kind of makes that make sense to me in in terms of why that guy would have perhaps developed this problem. And one, he's he's got his Apple Watch on his exposed to non-native EMS, he'd be in a gym working out under blue light. He would not be grounded. And we know we haven't mentioned in this interview, but um, grounding has an incredible ability to increase the zeta potential of your red blood cells and reduce coagulability. So that's a kind of interesting thought experiment at N, N equals one, but it to me makes um, logical and rational sense why not respecting our evolved natural light environment could lead to um, a problem like a severe cardiac problem like this yeah absolutely and you know that it's all about the accumulative effect that we need to look at so for example it depends also what is this guy doing as a job and what what is he doing with the rest of his time outside of the gym because if you are let's say working in an office and in your home you've got the wi-fi always on even when you sleep uh, so you're bombarded constantly by the emfs and you're constantly putting your body in a sympathetic state even though you're not aware of it and then you're going to train in a blue light gym with putting your body under more load, under more stress. You are more likely to, you know, be presented with these kind of problems if your body is under more load. So the greater the load it's under, the more likely we are to, you know, be presented with something that we don't want to be presented with. 
Yes, and and in this guy's case, he did didn't have any visceral fat, and he did look um, at least superficially um, very healthy. And Doctor Jack Cruz likes to particularly make the point that you, you we can be deceived by a physical appearance, and yeah. um, it's it's no protection to have a, an Adonis type physique if that physique is in in the context of of working out indoors and. I guess this idea of burying your mitochondrial density um, in the muscles mm. as opposed to in the brain and, and, and in the heart. Mm -hmm. Stealing electrons from where it's required mm. most. So mm. if your body is just running out, running out of electrons and you're just get constantly getting them stolen from your environment and then you know, in exercise anyway, you're using electrons to generate ATP. And so then you're just going to take it away from where it's required the most, which is your brain and your heart. And one thing that we actually didn't talk about was the melanin melanin topic and that's why also training outdoors is so beneficial because it's uh, another way for us to build our melanin and to absorb actually electrons you know from the from the sun so it's a fantastic another fantastic reason to be outside yes fa fantastic well um Andreas, thank you so much for for coming on i will can you can you give give patients or people an idea about where they can find you and how they can get in touch with you if they, they want to work with you and maybe some of your free content. Okay, thank you so much. So you can find me on Instagram uh, at Andreas underscore David underscore Christu. And you can also find my website at www.mobility-fitness.com. And then on there, there is a contact form. You can reach out to me by email if you wish to work with me one-on-one -on -one. I offer nutrition coaching, which is circadian appropriate and seasonally appropriate, uh, ancestrally appropriate, and uh, also lifestyle optimization. So to consider all the other aspects of life, which we didn't touch upon, like the other environmental stressors, endocrine disruptors, you know, all the things in the home that could be causing havoc and stress and inflammation on in our system, because all of these things, they can have a massive impact on our recovery process our sleep, our performance, and our health and vitality. So this is, I like to use a holistic approach when it comes to moving and exercise, but also the nutrition side of things as well. And also those mobility workouts that we talked about, you can find them on my website. Yes, and, and if you follow Andreas on Instagram, he always has some fantastic uh, video exercises. So you can watch him him doing those these type of exercises that we talked about just on, on Instagram. So uh, amazing that I think we've covered a, a whole bunch of very interesting and valuable topics and, and really actionable advice for, for people. So thanks, uh, Andreas. Really appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure.